الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد النور الكساري ومن ذلك الجاري واجمعيني بكل اطواري وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم يا نور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله thank you all for taking the time uh, on a weekday evening for coming out so we are beginning a new series uh, and this, the, the focus of this series is how to build healthy relationships uh, healthy marriages and healthy homes and so what we're going to do this is going to last for just about six weeks inshallah uh, and every week we're going to cover uh, different parts that all serve as uh, together kind of comprehensively what someone can do to build these uh, healthy home environments and healthy relationships. If someone misses a week, uh, we will be live streaming the courses, inshallah. Uh, so it's going to be available on YouTube, but we'll try to also make it such that each class is able to just kind of stand on itself. And even if you didn't attend the past one, um, it should still be beneficial, inshallah. So um, as we as we begin, what we want to do is we want to um, set the context for why it's so important to think about healthy relationships and healthy home environments. Um, in the time that we are living in especially, one of the forces at play is a force to try and destroy the family environment. And for Muslims, traditionally, we always saw that the strength of, some, of an individual then translated to the strength of their immediate family, which then translated to the strength of their community, which then translated to the strength of their society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also mentions in the Quran uh, various ayahs which could be interpreted in this way where he says Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change what is within themselves. So we always start with ourselves and then immediately Allah says in another verse that save yourselves and your families from the fire. And in this case, uh, th this, can, this can mean that save yourselves, your families, your immediate loved ones from doing things that will lead them to the fire, lead them down the wrong path. Now, it's not possible to help our families if our families aren't, uh, don't, don't have a healthy relationship in the first place. It's very difficult to try and give advice and to try and change situations where the foundations of those relationships are on very, very shaky and rocky grounds. We might be able to have an immediate impact or might be able to have a very, very short impact, but a long-term sustainable impact is not going to be possible. So for today's uh, session, inshallah, we're going to be talking about five or six of the core building blocks in accordance with our tradition, in accordance with our spiritual understanding of the healthy of, of, uh, of building healthy home environments and healthy families. And what we can do is, if uh, folks have questions, we will have time at the end for questions, but if it's something that's kind of immediately relevant to Excuse me to what we're discussing. Then you know, feel free to raise your hand, and we can and we can answer the question um, to the best of our ability, inshallah. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, and begin. So there's not going to be any one source like text that we're referencing. Um, I've kind of just put together uh, different different curricula for the entire series. Um, but if somebody wants to have follow up texts or wants to have something to kind of read along, uh, please do let me know, and I can give you. Uh, what 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 I'm using and what I'm referencing um, uh, to help with this, uh, inshallah. Bismillah. So uh, we'll start again with the uh, the the building blocks. And in our religion, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He stresses why foundations are so important. So in one ayah in the Quran, Allah talks about a masjid, and He mentions about this masjid that the the this is one of the earliest masajid, and from the first of the days, the awal yom, it was built upon the foundations of taqwa. And this is a masjid, it's still around today in Medina Manawara, it is known as Masjid Quba. And it is, it is a, it was a masjid that outwardly was not very grand, right? The masajid at that time were not grand outwardly, but the intentions that were made on that masjid were deep spiritual intentions that were done with an immense amount of Taqwa. Taqwa is this concept of God consciousness and awareness and the people uh, that the early generation, the Sahaba, when they built that masjid, it was done with such, 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 such grand intentions that to this day, there was one hadith where the Prophet wasallam he mentioned about this masjid, he said, um, the Sahaba, they were asking, you know, when we lived in Mecca, we could go for Umrah. And now we're in Medina, and so the journey, the journey for Umrah is like very lengthy, multi-day journey just to get to Mecca, let alone then the time where you're there, where you're performing Umrah and so on. 
Prophet وسلم, tells, told them, go to Masjid Quba and just pray two rakat and you will get the reward of a complete and accepted Umrah. That that was, again, the, 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 the foundations were so deep and they were so well, the intentions were so strong that all sorts of khair and all sorts of good came from that masjid. Similarly, we see with the way that the early community of Medina Manawara was built. It was built with deep intentions. So if anyone has ever traveled to Medina Manawara, it's it's a very um, uh, uh, lively place now. There is, there's a lot that's going on. Um, there's a lot of structures that are there. We, of course, have the, 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 the primary Masjid Nabawi, and then there are um, places for hotels and food and all sorts of other things. But in the Medina of the Prophet Wasallam. He came and it was just, it was Yathrib. It was like a swamp city. It was not like an attractive, appealing city. But because of the light that was in the heart of the Prophet Wasallam, and because of the intentions that he made for that city, now it is literally the place where people want to go and they feel at com it's like heaven on earth. It's a complete peace and sakina. And if people could, they would spend endless amounts of time there if they didn't have to return back. All goes back to foundations. So foundations of relationships are absolutely fundamental. If we don't get our foundations right, it's going to be very, very difficult. And so if we are, um, there are people at different stages of life. Some might be at a stage where they're looking to potentially get married. Others are at a stage where they're already, they're already married. They have a home. They have children. Um, others are at a stage where they might be on a slippery slope with certain relationships with, with their children or in their home environment. And so all of those different sitch setups require a little bit of a different type of, uh, or rather a different application of the same principles. And this is why hopefully what we cover should be uh, useful for different people at different stages of their life because these are principles in our deen. Principles are known as usul. And the usul, as long as someone understands them, they'll know, okay, at this situation in my life, I have to apply this principle. At this situation in my life, I have to apply this principle, and so on and so forth. So the first one is um, a, a, a building families with a deep-rooted love and compassion. And the goal here should be that we emphasize love and compassion uh, as a core part of the type of family setup that we have. Now, this, this is not... Uh, as simple as saying, you know, I love you and as simple as trying to show love. There's a deep root. This is when things get difficult. Someone still shows love and shows compassion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about the family. He starts by talking about the family in the context of the spouse. He says, with well, the famous ayah about marriage, among his signs is that he created for you, for you from yourselves mates. That, that, that you may find tranquility in them. إليها, and he placed between you affection and mercy. Mawadda, which is love and affection and mercy, which is compassion and rahma. And so he, he, he starts this, the marriage is what begins the family in our, in our religion, right? The institution of marriage is then what begins, the, the, the product of that is, uh, is the family. And so if somebody has a foundation of love and of gentleness and of compassion, that now starts the, the, them on the right trajectory. Now, we would think that this is, you know, kind of, you know, maybe it's obvious, but it's very easy for this to go south. Sometimes people may think that they have a, an understanding of love and understanding of compassion, but all the, all the, 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 the proof is it, arguments are happening all the time. There's a ton of anger and there's always stress. There's always tension. We'll talk about the products of these things, but it's litaskunu ilayha. Allah makes it very clear that you, we created for you soul, spouses from, from yourselves for what? So that you may find tranquility. The goal of the institution of marriage and the institution of the family is part of that is, is for peace. That you're supposed to, with all the difficulties and the hustle and the bustle and the stresses of life, you don't want to go home and it's just like stressful. That's not the whole, the point. The point is for it to be tranquil. So as uh, parents or spouses that the first goal we should have in mind is okay tranquility is important to us and how are we going to establish tranquility um, in in our homes uh, and so uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and he mentions in another verse in the Quran um, that uh, Allah commands good con Allah commands justice and good conduct and giving to relatives and forbids immorality bad conduct and oppression and so Allah links good conduct and family ties here very clearly. 
Um, and then he also talks about immorality and bad conduct in the same ayah. Because love and compassion are very, very, very much linked to the character that we have and how we treat people. That's how you know if somebody, there is like a real love and there's a compassion there. Otherwise, but, but as they say, it's all talk, right? Until somebody can walk the walk, the talk is not what's important. Um, and our, our children from young ages will pick up on empty words or actions that we take, but we don't translate them to showing them the right level of love and the right level of compassion. And we'll talk about again how we practically do that in a second. So the Prophet ﷺ mentions in one narration, the most beloved to you, the most beloved to me rather, among you, so the person who the Prophet ﷺ loves the most or the people he loves the most is the one who has the best character and who is the most gentle with his family. So now we are linking love and compassion and tranquility with two other components which are good character so you have love and compassion. They're exemplified through good character. And what is good character defined as with family? Gentleness. What is gentleness? Letting things slide. Being easy. Not making a big deal out of everything. Not creating tension and stress in the home. Right? Like speaking softly, speaking beautifully. We'll talk about that in the section on communication, inshallah. But that is part of this concept of, um, uh, of, 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 of or the, rather this building block of love and of compassion. And the Prophet ﷺ, he exemplified a significant amount of affection and compassion. He would regularly be seen playing with his grandchildren, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. Uh, to us, of course, they're Imams, uh, uh, but of course to him, they were his grandchildren. And he would play with them and he would kiss them and he would hold them and he would do, they would climb on his back when he was in sajda, uh, and he wouldn't, he would just prolong the sajda and just stay there for like a long time until they left. That this, it was, and he, he's, he's the greatest of Allah's creation. He has a lot to do. But when it came to children, there was a lot of gentleness. There was a lot of compassion. There was a lot of love. And there was a lot of mercy. And this is something for us to, uh, to take away, to learn from. That whatever stage of life we're at or that our children are at, they need the adult to show up with the love and the compassion. They don't necessarily know how to exempt, how to act in a certain way until the person who's you know in charge shows up in that way. And similarly, the spouses, they need that too. So he, the Prophet wasallam he had a very nurturing relationship with his spouses. He would express to them affection. He would t t tell the Sahaba to show, teach, teach the Sahaba rather, how to show them love and mercy and affection. It wasn't like a, um, uh, a the, 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 the Jahili Arabs, the, which, which bef with the, many of the Sahaba were in this state of Jahiliya before they converted to Islam. They didn't see expressing love and being nice to your spouse and so on and so forth as being like a, a manly thing to do, especially many of the men. They didn't see that. But the Prophet ﷺ, he redefined that manhood for them. And for, 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 for those who maybe struggled to express that, know, and especially the men, we should know that the greatest of Allah's creation and the manliest of all men was very soft and gentle at home. And yet he was a warrior on the battlefield and a warrior when he needed to be. And he knew exactly what to be in every situation. And that is what starts, to, what, what, what we want to aspire to is you, you and I should not be the same person at home that we are outside. We should be way better at home than we are outside, not the inverse, that we're great with everybody, we're great with our coworkers, we're so nice to them, and oh, how are you doing, and so on. And we, we come home, we start yelling at everybody, didn't you do this, didn't, what about this, what about, and it's just like this inverse. That's not the way. The way it should be, we have good character and akhlaq with everybody, but we save the most amount of the love and the mercy and the affection and the gentleness for the home. And then what's going to happen is the environment that's created if these building blocks are implemented is going to be one that people actually want to be around. We're living in a time right now where um, kids don't even want to be at home anymore. Teenagers, like they that, that, that wasn't always the case. It's actually a very Western concept that they've instilled in people's minds that somehow there's this like age of teenagers that are like they're these adolescents and they have to they hate their parents and all these other crazy ideas none of that is true traditionally not at all you go even to this day you could go to a muslim country and i've seen this with my own eyes like 
like I, uh, I see one of the scholars in, in, in Tarim, Yemen, um, walking around, which is a land of, you know, immense nur and, and light and, and knowledge, um, walking around with his son, like probably 14, 15 years old, full, like holding his dad's hand, like having a great time with his dad. Like here you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't see a, a, a somebody like, you know, barely being close enough to even walk in the same line, let alone like hold their dad's hand. That would just be seen as like, oh, no, it's so weird. What a weird thing to do. And then you would see them like the father steps outside and they grab the shoes. And it's not like they're being forced to. They grab the shoes and they immediately, you know, Baba, here's your shoes. Like it's like a, out of an adab and out of an etiquette. And it's a desire that they want to do. And obviously these are the, 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 the we look to them as our examples because these are the, the families of scholars and, the, and, 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 and hopefully they're practicing, right, what it is that has been taught in the religion. And thus this is the output. But in the time we live in, and I see this very frequently, you know, it's like dinner time comes around, everybody's in their own room, uh, everybody's doing their own thing, eating meals while while on their own screens, or if they are for fortunate enough to eat at the same table, someone's scrolling, someone's watching the TV, like there's very little, there's very little expression. So love and compassion can't come if there's no times to express the love and the compassion. It's impossible. You won't. You can't just exist. Those are just roommates. Then it's just people living in the same building, right? And and that's not what the goal is. The goal is a family. A family is a unit. It takes intentionality. It takes time. It takes expression. It takes conversation. It takes um, uh, 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 that, that 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 effort over and over again. And so, the Prophet Alaihissalam he would do this, and he would spend time with his family, and he would demonstrate this love and compassion. And so, what what ha the the their psycho psychological studies that have also shown that to have secure attachment in the family, um, uh, you need to have time where there's consistent love and support, not when we feel like it, but regularly, which then eventually leads to healthier adult relationships and greater emotional stability. So for those for for those uh, of us who may now not have these relationships, let's say somebody's um, at a point where they don't have the right relationships with their children. Children are in their twenties or in their thirties or their teens, and like there is no bond with the parents and the children. The key that begins then revisit these building blocks that we're talking about and say, okay, where where is it that I could have improved, and now what can I do to improve? And we'll talk about this in this section of, of, of communication and asking for forgiveness as a core part of healthy relationships. But one of the things that children desire the most when the parents make a mistake is just an, I'm sorry, like I really messed up. And it could have been for like a long period of time. Like, I'm sorry, I really messed up for those two or three years. I want to fix things. Because the inner child and every child wants to fix things. They want a harmonious relationship. But what people don't appreciate is someone saying, all this stuff, I love you, don't you see what I do for you? And that's not the same. It's, just, it's, it's a very um, uh, risky way to approach building a healthy relationship where, look, I make money, I make income, and, and I put food on the table, thus I love you. That is not something that someone, yes, it 100% is, a, is, a, is, a, is one way to exemplify love, no doubt. But that's not the primary way the human being needs. The primary way is through really deeply expressing that love and showing affection. So how does one start express this? So we'll, we'll talk about this in three different ways. First, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to actually show affection. It is to show affection. It's not one man came, the Prophet, one man um, saw the Prophet ﷺ kissing a child and he said, you kiss children? And he said, Yes, like uh, he he said the man said I have something like ten, I'm misquoting the I mean I'm paraphrasing the hadith I have something like ten children and I've never kissed any of them, and the Prophet said like what what are what is one to do with someone who has who has no mercy in their heart or who Allah has removed all the mercy in your heart because the the mercy is what leads to the affection you have like a little kid and a little baby and you know you're playing with them and so on you the natural affection leads to somebody showing that affection. But that affection, the need for affection never goes away. It doesn't go away. It just is expressed in a different way. You're not necessarily gonna pick up a, you know, you could pick up a two-year-old and throw them up and down and play with them and you're not gonna do that with your 20-year-old. Most people won't be able to. Maybe the 20-year-old can do it to you, but it's not gonna happen. But the need for affection is still there. 
the human being has a deep need for affection. And the affection is verbal affection and physical affection. So verbal affection is expressed through actual what are called positive affirmations. And this is a lost quality in some families where, where it's very hard to express like positive words to people. It's, we have no problem doing it to, again, our coworkers or, you know, somebody far removed or even our friends. Like, hey, man, like, thank you so much for helping me. Or like, I really like that you do this, this, and this. Or like, I really appreciate the way that you handled this, you know, assignment that you had or whatever. But when it comes to family, mm, now we get stuck, some of us, and we don't know, okay, how do I just like say, like, hey, I really, like, thank you so much for doing the dishes. I really appreciate it. This is both ways. If we're children, our parents are doing everything for us and they've been doing everything for us for decades. And like, when was the last time we said thank you, like consistently, not just for the big things, like thank you for buying me this big item. No, but for the daily, like thank you for making dinner and for when you were tired after coming home from work or a long day of this and for taking care of me. Thank you for um, uh, paying the electricity bill this month that was probably high because of something that, you know, that, that we were doing, right? Like these, this is, this is called appreciation and gratitude and Allah, we can't be grateful to Allah until we're thankful to people. And the people who we have to be the most grateful to are our family members, our parents and our, our children, uh, the ones in our immediate household. So this is so the way to practically apply this. So I'm going to we're going to do our best inshallah when we talk about each of these building blocks to talk about like a practical application just so we can implement it in our life inshallah. So one of the ways is it is some level of a of a positive daily affirmation to someone in our family. It doesn't have to be everybody, but where we encourage family members to express gratitude and shukr and compliments consistently and we do that ourselves. And um, uh, th th I know some, 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 some people, they literally will have a time set every week where they're just like, say thank you to each other for certain things. Like, this is our time to be grateful. Just like we have a time, you know, where, you know, you pray, you pray, you pray your prayers and you have certain dhikr you do after your prayer, right? And part of the dhikr is alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah is a form of expressing gratitude. So similarly, you can take, there's a structured way that you are thanking Allah. Now you take a structured way and we begin to thank our family. And it's very, very, very important. And it's very easy. And it doesn't cost any money. And it's, it, it's very simple also. It's hard to do if we're not used to it, but it's simple. It's much better to do that and to put in that effort day in and day out. So that way, the, when, 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 when things are difficult and we have to give negative feedback, const rather constructive feedback to our family, they'll be like, yeah, well, you're always saying such like nice things, so I'm glad to take the feedback. It's not like a, but, but if the only thing our family members hear is negativity, why isn't this right? Why did you get a B plus instead of an A? Why did you about that? What about all the negativity? Then when they do something right, there's no praise. There's no affirmation. Now they, the, 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 what happens is that the, the, the psyche of that person becomes wounded inside. And now it's wounded and they're seeking affirmation from the adults, from the parents. And same thing, the spouse is seeking affirmation from the other spouse. That's like why they, one of the main reasons they married that, that person was because they expected some level of, uh, of, 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 of this is a union, literally, and you're supposed to complete each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about how a spouse, it, it literally is a, is a cover for the other spouse. It's like a, like a clothing for the other spouse, libas. And so the same thing, the affirmation is like it goes a long way and just showing, yeah, that there is still love and connection present in that relationship. And so there's two ways. If we don't have um, a uh, practice of this or we're never used to it, it's going to be harder for us to do. But we have to just get over the hurdle and just start to do it. And then there's other people who they may already be in the rhythm of speaking kindly and positively and compassionately with affirmation to each other. And that's great if they can do that. Um, that they will they will naturally have the inclination, and then we should just increase it. So that's one. The second is then what what from the Sunnah of the Prophet Alaihissalam is actually that physical affection and physical touch, and this is especially important for the for for children that they feel a sense of comfort. Again, a lot of the stuff we're talking about super basic, like none of these things. I don't think there's going to be anything we cover in this entire series, which is going to be like some rocket science type of like opening. It's just going to be the fundamentals. But I, 
believe that in the time we live in, we're really we're missing the fundamentals. We, we, we could become a distracted society, and there's so much that we've lost touch with the human connection, um, and we don't know how to implement, many of us, we don't implement the fundamentals. So hopefully, just as a reminder for myself first and foremost, and to just get back to the basics, right? Um, and or sometimes we just might have seen a very wrong model. So most of the time, just, uh, just um, on, a, on a slight kind of tangent on this, most of the time the model people implement in their family is literally just the model that they saw growing up. There's, there's very little intentionality that goes in to most people's interactions. So if they, someone gets married, they will approach marriage the way they saw their parents approach marriage. Now that's great if their parents had a phenomenal marriage. But what if they had a terrible marriage? What if they had a marriage with fighting and tension and yelling and screaming all the time? Now what? Now they, now they literally will think, and I met people, that's what they think, that's what marriage is. On the other hand, we have a marriage crisis in our communities, and a lot of people don't, aren't getting married or are delaying marriage. And sometimes when you speak to someone and you say, and this, I've also spoken to folks like this, hey, what's going on? Like, why aren't you, you know, getting married yet? Or why aren't you looking or something? They say, well, marriage doesn't look so great. It looks like pretty, pretty tough and terrible and because they have a terrible definition of marriage because what was set forth for them as an example was not prophetic. And that's okay. Human beings make mistakes. But it's interesting because in any other area of our life, we get educated, we learn about something, then we embark onto that, that, we, 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 in, into that part, that phase of our life, right? Like nobody just becomes like a physicist Let's just say someone's parent, like your dad is a physicist, your mom is a physicist. You can't just say, I'm going to become a physicist and I'm doing it. And because I grew up with my mom, I'm now a physicist. It's impossible. Your mom would have to at least teach you all the core components. Then you'd still have to engage in some level of like a structured curriculum, get a degree, actually practice in a lab. And then you can now say, yeah, now I'm a, you know, I've, I've attained this, right? But for some reason, when it comes to this very difficult, the most important relationships in our life, spouse and children we just wing it it's just like i don't know i guess i'll figure this out as we go along we spend more time in our communities preparing for the wedding than for the marriage that's absolutely backwards which if we with more time on the, the 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 all the preparations and festivities than on the actual marriage and then that sometimes the marriage doesn't do, go too well because but people traditionally they would spend a lot of time learning understanding getting counseling and guidance from, you know, scholars or people who are specialized in this area. And then they would go into the, the now they're ready for the marriage, right? And it would not, the wedding would be like the Valima or something would be very, you know, sometimes simple, sometimes a little bit more than simple, but still it would not be the core focus of their energy. So this is why these building blocks become so important because we just kind of forgot. And, and Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ ذَكْرَةَ فَعَلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Remind for reminding benefits the believer. So we have to remind each other um, of these things. So the physical, the, the, the uh, verbal affirmation, then there's the physical affirmation and the physical touch, which is very important. It require, And so, again, basic stuff like do, when was the last time we like hugged our children? And, and now I'm talking at this point like, not like like kids who are like five years old, six years old, because it's very natural. I'm talking about like teenagers, right? Like that as you get older and older and older, when was the last time physical touch and connection was like a big core component of the family environment? And if it's not something we've seen growing up, all we have to do is just know, okay, it doesn't really matter what I saw growing up because the Prophet is my example, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes we have to, to, to accept the fact that our home environment growing up well, is not the example that we follow. That's okay. It doesn't mean that we like hold a grudge against our, you know, our parents or something. It's just in Allah says in the Messenger of Allah is the best example. So it doesn't even if someone has the best family and best parents, still the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best example. Isn't there's no, now the only way for someone to 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 learn from that is to implement that. So if we if we saw it implemented growing up, great. If not, that's okay. We just have to to go to 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 um, uh, kind of reframe it and rethink it. And I've also spoken to people who th this has been a, a challenge for them. They, they, I remember one time someone said like, you know, I see my my family doing certain things that I really don't like and I really don't appreciate. It doesn't like lead to healthy relationships, but like, I don't know, it's like, it's like my dad or it's like my, you know, in this case, I think it was this person's dad and it was like my dad. So I feel kind of like, well, if I go to someone else for mentorship or guidance who may be more closely on the sunnah, now I'm kind of like not being loyal to my dad. It was a very interesting question. And I, and I, and I thought about it and I was like, 
that's very noble of you to have that psychology. And at the same time, the greatest person for all of us who has more haqq on us even than our own mother and father is the Prophet ﷺ. So you are actually doing a service and if you can change what's called generational trauma because nobody changed it before you, you will now be a form of sadaqa jariya for your family. So it's a win-win for everybody, right? Uh, sadaqa jariya means continuous charity which um, you know can be done through, through knowledge uh, and somebody learning something and implementing it. So those are the first two. The third is actual acts of compassion which generate love between one another and between spouses and between children and parents and between siblings as well. All of what we're talking about also will apply to siblings. Like it's that's a very um, uh, important part as well. If we don't have healthy sibling relationships, the home environment can be very tense even if mom and dad have a good loving uh, environment. If the siblings are always fighting and there's all the tension, then that creates unnecessary issues in the home. So this, um, the, the method here, the way it's implemented is literally helping somebody with something that they need help with when they need that help, right? So you, uh, maybe, maybe one day, if, if, if mom is always the one who cooks the food, cook the food for mom and see like how, and, and sometimes it can mean ordering the food, right? That's also fine. But sometimes just like, just, you know, you can literally ask ChatGPT how to make anything and you'll get, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even joking, it'll give you a phenomenal recipe and then just, hey, okay, how, what are the steps? What are the ingredients that I need? And then what are the, the utensils and the pots and what temperature do I set the oven to? All this, it'll tell you everything and then just make it and mom will be so happy. And guess what? It's a way of showing, hey, I'm thinking about you instead of you always think about me. And parents, their natural dispensation is to always think about their children. Always. The children, this sensation is maybe sometimes we think about the parents, but maybe we just think about ourselves or maybe we think about our homework. Like there's this other stuff that we end up thinking about, but there should be some time. So we should have like a, a day where it's an act of compassion. What that does is it generates a bond, which now they, the, the, the person we do that act for is very happy. Same thing with um, spouses. If, 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 if one spouse generally does a certain type of activity, like let's say that husband always takes out the trash, one example, okay, one day, maybe like the trash is already taken out on, you know, Thursday night when, when it's, it's out and when, 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 you know, he, he, he usually goes to do it and it's like, oh, thank you for doing that for me. Such a small thing, but all it shows is, you know what, you're thinking about me and I appreciate that, right? And so, um, these are the small steps for, for, for if our parents are regularly having to, let's say, wake up early for work every day and they help out and drop us off to school or drop the kids off and make food. Okay. Say on the weekend now, let them sleep in. And we, we, as children take care of the, uh, of some errand or something that they had to do. So like there's at least a day or two of a break. These are the small things. This is the, the these are the acts of compassion, which on the daily basis, they go a long way. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, even though he was the busiest of all people, when he had something to do at home, he would do it himself many times. There's many examples. He would mend his own clothes. Like this is the prophet of God sewing his own clothing when it's ripped. And he could have asked anybody to do it. But he's trying to teach us something clearly, right? It wasn't this kind of like arrogant, well, no, I'm don't you know who I am and my status and this, this and that, I'm the greatest, You, someone someone do this for me. And that wasn't the, the case. And when he could go out of his way to help somebody else, he would always go out of his way to help someone else. And, and it wasn't even just his own family. Anybody who came to him with a need, he couldn't leave that person without taking care of the need. Even if he had to borrow money from someone else, someone comes to him for a need, this has happened in the, in the biography, in the prophetic biography, somebody would come to him for a need, and he couldn't give them what it is that they asked for. And he would ask some, one of the companions or someone in the community, can I just borrow some money and I'll pay you back so I can buy something to help this person out because they have a need. This is his, 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 his maqam and the example that he set for us, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so where are we at then with our own family when they have a need? It shouldn't even be like a question, right? It's the, it's, it's the small things. And so... There's various ways to show acts of compassion, but what we're trying to talk about here is just um, uh, the, the principles. So we, we, if we know these principles, then we can apply them. So the three we mentioned, the practical, the practical takeaways for, for building love and mercy in the home is 
um, uh, words of, of affirmation, uh, physical affirmation and touch and um, showing that love and then acts of compassion. And now this will create that environment. You'll see with the children, they grow up, they'll be doing that. They'll, they will go and will say like, um, you compliment them on, oh, you look so nice today. You look so pretty, mashallah. And then next thing you know, the child will be complimenting you, even though they don't fully understand what they're saying. Oh, you look so pretty, mom, mashallah. You look so nice, dad. You look so handsome or so on. But if nobody ever praises another person or nobody ever does it, they just quote unquote mind their own business. And it's not a good, it's not a good thing. In a family, you do not want people just uh, keeping quiet. That's like not what you want in a family. That's, that's, that, that, that's, that's risky. You want like conversation and engagement and, and, and exchanges and love. That's what we want. And there's going to be tension and conflict with that, which we'll get to in one of the principles. How do we resolve conflict in a healthy way? That's normal. But what silence is, is someone shut off now. They shut down. Right? You, you want to silence the computer. You, you put it in sleep mode or you shut it down. The human being will also just shut down. That means that they don't want it. Their mind is somewhere else completely if they're always quiet. That's a very dangerous sign. It's one of the first signs some intervention is needed as a, as a, in a family, whether that's the husband or the wife or the parents or the children. Something's off. And our job, if we want to be good family members and good Muslims, is to inquire, what's going on? And how do I fix this? And use techniques to, 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 to fix that, which we'll um, also get to, inshallah. So the second component, then, the second building block is um, respect and dignity. So... Uh, a home environment that is built with mutual respect and, and, and an environment of dignity are fundamental to having harmony in the home. And really it's important to honor the role that each person has. So what does this mean? That you and I do not want to create a home environment where the people don't respect each other. If the children see mom and dad don't respect each other, what, when we'll talk, disrespect is usually verbal disrespect or some action that we take that's just outright disrespectful, right? Um, and and so if they don't see that, they won't. The siblings won't respect each other, and then eventually they won't respect the parents. And now that just leads to like a very disrespectful um, uh, environment that's been that's been created. And so the prophet, um, or in in one verse in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says, "And your Lord has decreed that you do not worship any except Him, and to your parents that you offer good good treatment, good akhlaq." And so it's Allah commands respect, especially for children to the parents. So the in this state situation, and this is where the structure is really important because in our in our structure, in our religious structure for families, which we do have a structure, and we even if we grew up in the West, we should refresh ourselves and of the structure that our tradition offers and not follow any other influence of a structure that we've had, especially of a society which is like very clearly on its way down. Like we can see the priorities of these people and it's not the priorities of the, of, of the Muslims, especially the leadership in these countries. And so uh, one of those is respect to the parents. So you actually respect your elders. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, he is not one of us or you could say she, right? They are not one of us who does not have mercy on young children and they do not honor the elderly. So it's two ways. And um, uh, the respect of the parents, and there's a way for parents to be respected, which is also done uh, with some hikmah, meaning you don't, you don't want to force like, just got to respect me. That's a little bit risky uh, of an approach. But, but as children now, whether we live at home or even if our parents are, are if they're, if they're you know, blessed to be alive and they are alive, we should really kind of calibrate what does respect mean in the structure that we have. Because if we don't understand that there is a hierarchy, there is, it's, we're not equal. We don't like call our parents by their first name. I remember the first time I saw someone call their parents by their first name, like in school, and I was like, what did you just say? And they're just like, yeah, like Barbara's coming to pick me up. I'm like, who is Barbara? And like, that's my mom. And I'm like, wait, what? That's, oh, or maybe it was like, that's my stepmom. But still, I just, you can't even fathom it. What on earth? But so respect is shown in which we'll talk about how it's shown. But as a principle, respect is really important. And there's three parts to this. This is the hierarchy that's important to understand. So first and foremost, children absolutely have to show some level of thought, deem, 
and respect to their parents, meaning there is a station, that there are above us in a station. And it doesn't mean that they're infallible, that they're not going to make mistakes, or that they might, some might just be outright bad people. But even those whose parents did things that were not the most righteous, even Ibrahim al Islam, the story in the Quran, he still spoke very, how, what does he say? Ya Abati. What is his, his uh, that some say it is his father, others say it's like his paternal uncle um, who is being referred to here. Uh, but if we go with the, the literal meaning, right, which could be that his, it's his father. His father is literally worshipping idols. I mean, he's doing some serious stuff. He's doing stuff, and he, he's, Ibrahim is one of the greatest of Allah's prophets, and yet he's speaking to him with so much gentleness and love. Ya Abati. And so that's a lesson for all of us, that we need to... to to, to, to speak to our parents with gentleness and with love. And we're going to make mistakes. I remember just the other day, I was, you know, my, my wife helped me, alhamdulillah, realize this was, I was having a conversation with my parents, and then on the drive home, she, she told me, she said, you know, that you were getting way too firm with them. Like, they're getting older now, and like, the way how firm you were, and I was like, oh no, I was just trying to make a point. And she's like, yeah, but that's not how you make a point with your parents. And I was like, oh, you're right, these are my, my peers. Sometimes when you get to a certain age, you might think, that we are, we're talking about the same stuff on the same plane, but we're never on the same plane. Absolutely not. We can't. It's impossible. So there'll always be, like, uh, uh, even if the topic is something similar that we can all engage in, versus when you're like two years old and your parents are 30, you can't talk in the same way. But when you're 30 and your parents are 60, you can talk in the same way, meaning in terms of the same intellectual possibilities of conversation, but it, the maqam is so different. The adab and the respect that's shown is so different. So... It was a, um, you know, it was a useful um, reminder that re how critical respect is, and and uh, and how we have to then remind ourselves. Okay, that what am I going to? So that that's one sign of respect so of the parents. Then there's a sign for the for the spouses. So for the for the wife to respect the husband, and for the husband to respect the the, the spouse, the wife. It's not a like one person rules all environment. We'll talk about this in the structure in our in our in our religion. We do have a structure that Allah has given on this is the ideal family structure and this is how uh, the home the household should be set up and this is what He's given as the rights and responsibilities. Um, and uh, and and there is a different differing um, psychological need when it comes to respect for men and love for women. So the dominant kind of psychological theory that's, that's, that's mentioned is that men tend to have a higher need for respect and women tend to have a much higher need for, for affection and authority it, or affection and love. But it doesn't mean that the other, like, that one just gets one entire part of this and gets none of the other. Right? Both sides need respect and dignity. We don't speak to our spouses disrespectfully. But if the children now, let's say they are respecting the parents, now the parents and the, the spouses have to show respect to each other. That's obviously important. That's how we communicate to each other and um, uh, the language that we use. It goes back to basic words. So, for example, one is having a conversation. If we get a little bit heated and instead of saying something that's rude, we now say something, we say something that's healthy conflict resolution like, I really feel that when this is done, um, I get upset and I would appreciate if you stop doing it. Instead of like, what are you doing? Don't you know this? And we just start getting disrespectful, calling names and so on and so forth. It's a problem if the home environment has gotten to a point where using, where raising voices all the time is normalized and where using names is normalized. What does it mean to use names? Like just bad words, bad names, whether that's in English or in Urdu or in Arabic or in Farsi or in what insert whatever home, language we speak at home here. It, that's a big problem. Something major now needs to be turned around because the kid is sitting there watching growing, this growing up and then you know at age nine, the kid starts using bad words. I'm like, what are you doing? Where did you learn that? They're like, well, I learned it from you. No, I never said that. No, you said it in Urdu, but I'm saying it in English, and it's the same. The meaning is actually the same. Now, what do we do? We get mad at the kid, but it was just our own fault because we created an environment where we didn't speak with respect. We didn't speak with, with, with we weren't dignified. A dignified human, anytime you want to think about dignity, just think, would the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say this in this conversation? Would he approach this conversation in this way? And if the answer is no, okay. That means something about it is not in alignment with the, the dignified sunnah. And if the answer is yes, alhamdulillah, we continue down that. Um, we continue down that. So 
uh, what, what happens now when you respect at a conversational level and when we respect at a practical level, meaning we respect the, in, the um, intentions of somebody, we respect their preferences, there's a lot of things that we can respect, as long as they're within Islam. If somebody has like a, uh, a preference for one thing over the other, as long as, you know, again, this is not like a child who says, I'm not going to eat anything except french fries, that's not what we're talking about, but like a basic, now what happens is what we end up teaching somebody when they have to draw, and we'll talk about what a boundary is shortly, when they have to draw a boundary, meaning like, hey, I can't handle this anymore. Like a difficulty comes up in a relationship. As they get older, especially this happens more. They will know how to draw that line with respect and with adab and with etiquette. And they'll know how to have a, res a respectful adult conversation. Like, okay, I actually... Um, for example, things start to get complicated when you someone's married. So if they if they have now, um, let's say the children get married. There's in laws in the picture. There's maybe someone's living with the with the parents. There's all, all sorts of more people start entering into the home, and so now it happens. Sometimes people will do things that rub each other the wrong way, or sometimes a relationship will be causing a rift. So often. Um, uh, somebody's parents, so two people are married, one of their parents is causing problems that gets in the way of the marriage. Now that's an immediate sign that that needs to be fixed because the marriage must be preserved. It doesn't mean one cuts off that parent, but this is where what's called a healthy boundary is drawn, where one now has to learn with respect and etiquette, how do you draw that boundary with that parent to say, hey, like really it's impacting my relationship with my spouse. So I need you to not do this anymore, and I would really appreciate it. You do it with loving, gentle nature, but if they never saw respect codified from an early age, they won't be able to do it. And either they won't do it at all, or they'll go to an extreme, and they'll do something like, I don't want to talk to you again, ever, and, da, 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 and don't come to my house, and so on and so on. And it'll just be really, really aggressive and intense because there was intensity and aggression was what they saw growing up instead of love, compassion, respect, and dignity. And so, um, uh, how does this, uh, does one do this? Um, it, it starts with with the basics. So the first thing is one just values what the other person has to say. So if you if if let's say the the parent um, or let's say you know, someone's son is speaking to them, they might say something that's kind of like you might not fully agree with, but you should never just cut them off. And be like no 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 no, I can never be like that. Let me tell you how it is. All right, now you just show I have no respect for your for your words. Okay, you do that the first time, maybe it'll, the fifth, sixth time someone does that, they're just not going to say anything, or they're going to start inserting themselves in conversations through the same approach, cutting people off and doing things disrespectfully. That's not any way to communicate. The Prophet, he would let people finish what they said, and he would look at them completely, and he would turn to them, and he would have a full conversation with them. It wasn't like a, um, uh, like a, a race to finish the conversation. And he would even listen to people and what they had to say when they were doing things that were really, really off. And he would let people do actions even that were really, really off, and then he would teach them. And so this is another part then of respect is knowing when is the time to teach and when is the time to let someone express what it is that they need to express, right? Um, uh, so for example, one time, a man came into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and he literally urinated in the mosque. And what? It, and the Sahaba, they got very upset, like swords out, everything, they're all riled up. And what does Prophet ﷺ do? He says, let him finish. Amazing. He said, let him finish. So this man finishes doing that and then the Prophet ﷺ goes to him and he says, with respect, with, he didn't want to make this man feel undignified or just speak disrespectfully to him, even though he had every right. He could have said if he wanted to, get out of here, what are you doing? But he didn't say that. This is the house of Allah. We don't actually go, we don't We don't relieve ourselves here. We, this is a place of worship. And he explained to him with hikmah, with gentleness, with wisdom. And then he um, explained to him why it was wrong and then what, you know, you know, to kind of resolve the situation. And then the man, he made dua for, for the, he said, may Allah only have mercy on, on me and on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Nobody else because he saw how angry the Sahaba got, right? Like the, the and we're paraphrasing the story here and the narration here um, for the sake of, um, uh, for the sake of brevity. But an example, this is one example, right? Like the, how one communicates and what they do and when we 
intervene and when we don't intervene is going to set the bar for a lot of things it's all basic stuff and this is why a lot of this boils down to like to do this you have we have to work on ourselves there has to be a willingness like i'm gonna need to change the worst thing that can ever happen for any family is someone in that family says i don't know what nothing's wrong with me i don't need to change you guys must be the problem right that's now now it's basically like that person is really, really messing up their dunya and their akhirah. Because the sahaba, the greatest of the sahaba were always willing to change. No problem. Someone gave them feedback, they would take the feedback. They would go and inquire about the feedback. And so sometimes our children, we might not notice this, but just pay attention next time. Someone's having a conversation. Do we cut them off? Do we let them finish? If it's something that's not making sense, do we let them... Um, um, uh, uh, finish expressing themselves and then get involved in the conversation or do we um, uh, immediately insert ourselves into the conversation and there's a there's a difference and it starts with the basics so making sure that there's a level of conversation and then the second thing is listening fully like being attentive and listening this is a lost sunnah of the Prophet we don't listen anymore there's a difference between hearing and listening hearing is like you can hear, you know, if, if, if there is a microphone, you can hear the person speaking in the microphone. Listening is active. Hearing is passive. So if our children are speaking and we're on our phone or our spouse is speaking, you know, wife speaking to the husband, husband's just like on the phone, you know, reading all the news about the election and so on and so forth and just like, oh, what's going on here? Oh, and uh, speaking, speaking, speaking. Oh, what do you think? And it's just like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And it's big, they didn't hear his, they didn't listen to anything. They just heard it. Right, a very very big deal. So actively listening is very important. Um, same thing with if if our children don't see us listening to them, they won't want to talk anymore. And then it's on us that when they were five years old, they were telling us about some you know some story of something happened at school and we're like yeah, it's there. There's there's no like um, uh, intellectual like exchange that's happening. They are just expressing themselves and they want the parent to listen. But if the parent isn't listening, it's like, no, I got work to do and I got to work. For the limited time we're, we're with them in that quality bonding moment, now the bonding moment's gone. Now when they're 15, that was when they were five. Now when they're 15 and you want them to talk to you, hey, where are you, what are you thinking about college? I don't know. Hey, what do you think about this? I have no idea. They're 21. Hey, like, is what do you think? Like, maybe we should, you know, potentially consider, you know, it's time for you to get married or something. Like, should we, do you want to talk about that? I don't know, not really. Because the, when it was young, it didn't happen. Now, all of a sudden, it's not going to happen on our terms. That's why this stuff, it has impacts. And for those of us, uh, uh, if we have young children, we should remind ourselves of this. That what we do now is going to either pay off later or really, really, we're going to be, we're going to hurt, we're going to be hurting inside later. Because, oh man, I did something wrong. Like, why did, why did I let it get to that point where now this, like, this child never wants to talk to me about anything serious? And I see that happen all the time. And parents will be like, I don't know what to do. Can someone, they'll, they'll go and ask somebody, can you talk to my child? They don't talk to me about anything. The other random, you know, insert person's name here won't be able to fix it necessarily because a deep root of stuff, that's going to require therapy and it's going to require apologizing and it's going to require going deep into understanding what happened. Why do they feel that way, right? And it doesn't make us, make us bad people. It just means we didn't have the, we didn't learn the tools. All it makes us is people who maybe didn't actively go out and seek the tools. And that's part of our religion is anytime someone enters into any new part of their life, it is wajib on them, meaning it is obligatory to learn the requisite knowledge for what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have told them about that part of life. So when someone becomes, when someone hits puberty, now it becomes obligatory to learn how to pray, how to fast, how to pay zakat. Eventually, if they intend on going to hajj, as they get closer to that, how to go to hajj and so on. If somebody gets married, it's wajib on them to learn the rights and responsibilities of marriage according to one madhab. The rights and the, the fiqh of divorce, essential to learn because somebody might say something that could indicate divorce they might not even know. It's, so when someone starts a business, we got to learn the sharia uh, components of, of business transactions and so on and so forth. So relationships, similarly, we have kids. Maybe I'm doing something wrong to my kids or not wrong to my well, How do I know if I don't have any framework? And if you don't have a framework, whatever society you live in will just, that's the framework. And that's not the framework we want. We, we want a framework that's in alignment with our tradition. So 
actively active conversations, active listening is very, very important um, in order to have this 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 part of um, uh, this part of respect. And then when somebody starts to speak disrespectfully, right, we start to correct that language with wisdom and use respectful language. And if we need to, um, you can have two gauges of respectful or disrespectful language. The first gauge is like where you actually think about the phrases that are used and the phrases that, you know, this is a disrespectful word, this is a respectful word. The other one is just like, does it make, does it bother you inside when someone speaks like that? Or does it make you feel like a expansion and like a happiness? And 99% of the time, respectful language makes somebody feel good and happy and like there's an expansiveness. And disrespectful language really constricts someone just like starts to raise their anxiety and their you know their blood pressure and their stress and that's a sign as well um so those are there's different ways to do it but i would recommend a mix of both where one tries to then set the set the precedent as the people as those in our family who are trying to do this and then when someone is on their way to get married same thing if someone's not married yet they'll they'll be able to see oh how does this person speak to me when they're talking to them, is it respectful? Can, how do I understand if they have a respectful undertone to their life? Um, and that will be very helpful. So with that, we want to be mindful of, we want to be respectful of time uh, and make sure that we uh, end appropriately. So if there's any questions, um, we can do questions online. If there's any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. Um, and then we will go ahead and um, end, end, inshallah, with a short dua. Anything? Bismillah. Okay, how about online if there's any questions? Let's see if we can figure out a question. So if you have a question and you're streaming on YouTube, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. And if you're on TikTok, you can go ahead and um, put it in the uh comments and yeah for those who are asking so the class we're now do our wednesday classes used to be uh 7 p.m and now they're 6 30 p.m to 7 30 p.m pacific so we've moved the time back just because of the time change and everything um so 6 30 p.m to 7 uh 6 30 to 7 30 pacific inshallah okay any advice on raising small children uh if you could give me advice i have a small child right now alhamdulillah um so everything that we discussed right now what we're going to be discussing throughout the class is going to apply to um, raising small children and to growing our families and to doing so in a healthy way. So um, the advice is going to be throughout the next six weeks. It's not going to be uh, kind of all at once. Um, but the building blocks that we're talking about, we have to learn how to make them apply. The advice I'd give myself first and foremost, like very, very relevant to me in, in life right now is, um, that we figure out how does it apply to the context that we're in. So if we have young children, like we have a toddler, the way we dis we show compassion and mercy is going to be different than if we had a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old. Speaking respectfully to them is going to be different because they might not even understand every word that comes out of our mouth. For them, it might be actions. So we have to now think about how do we apply it to the prism of the situation that we're in and the context that we're in, um, and then we go ahead and, uh, and and implement it accordingly. So, so my recommendation would be that we take the um, the building blocks that we are discussing, and we then think about okay, based on the person who I need to apply this with. If it's if I'm newly married, it's for my spouse. If I'm not married yet, I'm looking to get married. It's in the prospective spouse. If I already ha am married and I have young children, it's how do I apply this to a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old? If I have teenage children, same thing. If I have older children, same thing. If I have elderly parents, same approach, right? And so now that prism, I'll try in the future, uh, in the next class, to mention how it can be applied to just a few of those categories. Um, but I think for most of what we covered today, I did bring in a few of those examples, so it should be you know, it should be relevant, inshallah. Uh, and the question, can this be applied if the spouse has mental issues? So uh, it's a good question, and it is a very, um, uh, it's, it's more and more of an issue now where somebody in the relationship might have like either an undiagnosed or a diagnosed mental issue. So if it's, if, if it's an undiagnosed mental issue, meaning you think that there's a problem, but you don't know for sure, nobody has um, like actively said that, uh, yes, you should be able to assume that that it can be applied. 
And until you get to a point where somebody diagnoses them like, hey, they have this problem and they need this medication, or they have this trauma that they're carrying and they need this to be resolved, we should be able to take the general principles and the teachings that we have, the usul that we have in our tradition, and apply it in that context. However, if somebody, let's say, is diagnosed with like a mental condition, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, bipolar disorder, some condition, um, th until they take the prescribed, and, and, and there's a medicine for it, so let's say there's a psychiatrist who, who, who diagnosed it, until they take the prescribed medicine, you can't assume that they're going to be a rational actor. I mean, a rational actor, and this means like a rational person who's going to understand things in the same way that somebody who doesn't have any of those things uh, interact, because they literally will have chemical imbalances. And then their, 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 their chemical imbalances will prevent them from, from receiving things the way you and I perceive them to be received. So we might speak to somebody in a certain way, and they might think we're attacking them, but we're just literally speaking normal conversation. And if they have an issue, until the medicine is done, it's going to be very difficult. But if there's no issue, um, or we just say like, yeah, yeah, you have a mental problem because we're like, we don't know, but we just are really up, you know, up to our, uh, up to a certain point with them, then we should we should start the discussion in a little bit of a different way, where where we mention to them like, I think you might not receive this in the best way, or you have these problems, um, or, or 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 you've exemplified signs or exhibited signs where there could be something deeper. I'd really appreciate if we could go together to get some help. If not, I want to figure out like how do we, how can we make this work? How can we improve this situation? And then I have a few tactics that I learned that you know I saw that, that I heard the Prophet some would do. I heard are good in our tradition, and then you would discuss that with them. But I'm also open if you have something, right? So that's one way to do it. Or sometimes people only do things if it's their idea. So you find a way to like, you know, use inception techniques to make it seem like it's their idea. And then they'll implement it. The goal is just that it gets implemented in in, in the life, yeah, in our life. Um, okay. Any other questions? So, if there's anything online, just go ahead and post it in the chat comments. Anything in person? Anyone? Okay. okay we'll just wait for another thirty seconds or so, and then if there's nothing, then we will. Um, go ahead and, and, and so next week, inshallah, yeah, so same time. Um, again, this is short, short series. We'll aim to have it done by right before, uh, like late December, uh, like the kind of the winter holidays. Um, so it'll, it'll go from, from now until then about six or so weeks, inshallah. Yeah. Um, okay. Someone says today, children, uh, Today, children are more mischievous, and I get angry, and I can't handle it sometimes. Everything they take is a joke. So if you are dealing with a situation where children are taking everything as a joke, and that's now the the way that they're uh, approaching that is through like some level of, of, of mischievousness, three things you should monitor. Number one, what are they watching and what are they consuming? So if the content that they're consuming, either on TikTok or on Instagram or on Netflix or Hulu or Disney+, Plus or all the other content platforms that are out there now, are ones where the they make it seem like j everything's a joke because that is what the content is. Most of it is all just jokes. It's all just like it's very odd jokes on their parents, jokes on on each other. It's a very very there's no serious there's no digni dignity out there anymore. It's not dignified content. So now you're going to have to find a way to help them unlearn what they've learned as normal. Most of the time the content is 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 the problem. If you say hey actually they're not really even consuming that much you then move on to the next thing, which is their friends. Okay, what companionship do they have? And wh who in their friend circle or which, wh which people in their friend circle could be the ones who are making it seem like it's totally okay for them to behave in this way? And you don't uh, you know, immediately um, kind of tell them, get rid of this friend or something like that. Now, with wisdom, you have to find a way to find new friends with, 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 with maybe uh, better akhlaq and better character and get them to slowly gravitate away from these older, from these different friends. Or you ask them, like, hey, what, you know, oh, that's, that's, that's so interesting what you said today. Like, who told you that? And then they'll say, oh, it was Johnny at school who told me that. And it's like, oh, okay, interesting. God, thanks for letting me know. You know, you just, you don't, don't make, don't make, you just note it. Okay, got it. So regularly, this guy's name is coming up. Johnny's name is coming up. Maybe, maybe Johnny is the problem. Now I need to find a way to remove Johnny 
from the from the equation in my child's you know friendship circle. Um, so that's one. That's two. And then the third is uh, it's it could be somebody else in their life, like like an older sibling or even like a parent, where you might be making jokes all the time, um, like and thinking it's you might be talking about your brother-in-law and making a joke and your child just thinks oh yeah yeah well I can make jokes about people too and I can be like and the way that they apply it is through this realm of mischievousness because that's your children have this in them but the way we applied it we just thought it was a light-hearted joke we just joke about things and this also applies to um, sometimes parents will wonder why is my child always on a screen and for the child, the screen is the video games. Like, why am my child? I, so many parents ask, my children are always playing video games. What do I do? And the first question we should ask ourselves is, how often are we on our phones? Because, or, or watching the news on TV. Because to us, that's, that's our screen time, and then this is their screen time. There's literally no difference between the two. So if they don't see, and they're like, why can't they just read books? Well, when was the last time we read a book? And we read, if you read books in front of them, they were going to read books. That's just all they know what to do. It's this how human, if we, rem so, so same thing. If we're doing something at home, they might um, do something different at home. Um, okay, uh, having a tough time teaching my children Quran at home. Uh, any advice? Uh, this could happen for a few different reasons. Um, uh, one is that they actually maybe want, uh, maybe would benefit from like a external Quran teacher, right? So sometimes um, you want to have a different teachers who are teaching children different things. So we might teach them certain parts of their Islamic uh, education, and then there might be something else where maybe they now need to be around 10, 20 other kids who are all doing Quran at the same time. So let's say you have two kids. You sit down, you teach Quran, and it's like the same living room that or family room that you like hang out in, and that the TV is there, and they watch. They they have their toys or whatever. They they're not in the mode. They're not in they're not in the zone necessarily, right? So this could be one. So, so now you take them to the masjid or to the to the local Quran school or something, and now there's 20 other kids, and children are like, oh, everybody's learning Quran. Okay, maybe I should do it too. So that could be one one reason. If that's if you try that, and let's say that's not the case, um, or they're already doing that, and you're just trying to revise with them at home. Um, then uh, the love of the Quran has to be instilled before the, um, the teaching of the Quran. So the love of the Quran first starts with the love of the messenger of the Quran, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Until they love the Prophet sallam deeply and they, 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 you'll know if they love the Prophet sallam. Like they'll say things that'll just be like, okay, like you clearly will, like you'll say the Prophet sallam's name and then they'll be like, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They'll just do all these things that just like, oh, okay, you clearly have like an attachment to him and you really honor and raise his status and talk about the Prophet sallam a lot, talk about him a lot and talk about how amazing he was and how much he did and read them the children's stories about the Prophet. And then, then you slowly say, you know what? You know who, who said who this Quran was revealed to? And they'll be like, oh, who? It was a brother of the Prophet. Oh, really? Okay, and then the, now you teach them what does that mean. And then you say, hey, don't you want to learn the book that Allah sent through the Prophet? Wow, don't you want to learn it? And you have to do it in a very, it, it's, it might take six months just before you even teach them the first letter. You, all this pre-work that you do. And then you say, okay, we're going to start with Alif. And then you start working them through that, right? Versus if you, you know, they come home from playing at the park and you're like, all right, sit down now, it's time for the Quran lesson, like... You know, most of us are going to run away from the Quran lesson, let alone the the, the, the children. So hopefully that will that will help. Um, Assalamu alaikum. What should be done if the child questions everything the parent tells them not to do or do? For instance, um, it's not time to you know it's time to do your Islamic lesson, or it's not time to wear you know makeup or something or so on. Good question. Um, so there is uh, a rebellious nature which can come out in human beings and in children especially. And the, uh, the approach that we should take shouldn't immediately be, and again, I'll say this to myself first and foremost, to snap or to get angry. It should be, okay, why is it that they are not, question, they are not in understanding when I say to do something for them to do it? And usually it's because the authority is not established in the first place. So the child now does not have an understanding that, they're, that, that who the authority is and who the one who receives that authority is. So now in every situation, they're going to question that. So our work has to be, first and foremost, to gently, with wisdom, but with some level of, um, uh, of, of firmness, to reestablish that authority and to explain to them, depending on the age that they're at, Okay, who actually is the one who's going to say what to do and who's going to be the one who is going to be receiving that, right? And 
um, and, and, and to not allow for any semblance of this is like an equal relationship. It's not. And it's really hard for like people in the West to understand that because they want to just talk about uh, 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 very warped forms of equality in their view. Um, but at the end of the day, the mother and father are the boss and the child has to respect what they say. And it doesn't mean that they have they will do so respectfully, but they still have to respect it. And then what we do is if let's say we can first get past that first hurdle where they actually get to listening, now we teach them, okay, how do we listen and not make a big fuss about it and whine about it all day afterwards, right? And explain to them whichever motivational source they have. Sometimes it's they want to please Allah. Sometimes it's something else and say, you know what, Allah really, really is happy when you do this, this, and this. So like, let's, let's find a way to work, work, work it out. Or we, you ask them for feedback. This is also really important. Sometimes we don't ask our children for feedback. You can say like, you know, um, I asked you to do this. You didn't really do it. Like, is there, was there something I said? And now they'll be like, oh, actually, no, you, you were totally right. Or they might say, yeah, yeah. Why did you yell at me when you did that? Why couldn't you just be nice? Why, if you told me not to wear, let's say, in this question, this question about makeup, why did you have to be mean about it? Why couldn't you just gently say, like, you look so beautiful without makeup? That's a very different way of saying something than why are you doing this? It's, I don't want you to do it. You're going to get the same outcome, hopefully. But one is a positive way. Look at the way. And so this is for us as, um, as parents or as, uh, as people who are the one, let's say, giving advice. It's very interesting the way the Prophet ﷺ would give advice. He would, when he wanted someone to do something, he would praise them about everything it is that was already good. And so one time he was saying about Abdullah bin Omar radiallahu anh, the son of the, Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anh, he said, what an amazing man Abdullah bin Omar is, if only he prayed the night prayer. So he began by saying how amazing he is. And then he's saying, if only he did this one extra thing, which is prayed the hajjad, he'd be even more amazing. And Abdullah bin Omar radiallahu anh, he heard that. Boom, never missed the hajjad. He was just, he was on it. He's like, this would make the person I love happy. I'm going to do it. But it's very different than, than, than kind of a commanding way to do things. So sometimes we just have to find a way to do so with beauty rather than with, you know, um, strictness. But the authority does need to be established. That's, that's a, that's a important one. Uh, how do we enjoy, they say, non-Islamic festivals where children are invited and want to celebrate alongside them? What should I do? Uh, so actually, this is uh, you don't you don't enjoy them. This is a very black and white um, component. The, we have our tradition and our religion and our festivals, and we don't we don't mix those up with other people's traditions and other people's festivals. So, um, if you, the the key here actually is to enjoy ours so much that we really feel no need or desire for any other traditions, festivals, or celebrations, or so on and so forth, even if the children are going to public school and they see everybody else doing it because they'll have had such a blast. So the first component here is one understands the how much better what Islam has to offer is than every other tradition. And you don't need to do this in a, like, you don't have to go that deep to, to figure this out. Just do a basic study of other religions, how much they follow other traditions and other religions, and how much those are actually being implemented. And then under, we, we, we start to understand that uh, Islam is literally the, the last standing religion which still has some semblance of a moral code intact. And then we have to affirm the proper status of our religion above other traditions and like above other frameworks rather of living life. So if our children think that the only way to live life is like the way every Westerner lives life. You celebrate Christmas and Halloween and you wear costumes and all this stuff. And you and then when it comes time for Eid, the parents are working on Eid. Nobody takes a day off. Nobody makes it a big deal. You know, or, or, or some other celebration in our religion comes up. There's other parts of our religion which also have celebrations. Then, of course, they're going to gravitate towards the other festival. But if you make a huge deal out of your festivals, out of Eid, and, and, and you give gifts and you light the house up in Ramadan, 30 days of Ramadan, the house is lit up. And sometimes for, for those who, who celebrate in Rabi al-Awwal, they'll put lights up and they'll put in a Mawlid Mubarak signs and so on. People different depending on what level of celebration people like to do for certain things, right? They will literally go and it'll be, they'll make it really fun. And then Halloween rolls around and then you just tell them. Now you have to educate yourself. 
explain to them the origins, the the pagan Celtic origins of Halloween and of these problematic holidays and what they do and how it's related to, to how many dark spiritual forces are present when these things are celebrated and, and, and there's demonic elements and jinn elements and all these and explain it to them and, and, and educate yourself and then explain. And then same thing with Christmas. Be like, yeah, it's great with the Christmas tree and with, you know, it looks great. It looks really, really fun, but let's talk about like what they're actually doing and are they even following the teachings of Jesus? Because if they were, guess where Jesus was? He was in Palestine. So where on earth are all these Western people who are about to celebrate Christmas in two months? Where is their stance on Palestine? Why are they allowing all the carnage that's happening to our people in Palestine when Isa al Islam was a Palestinian? And you just like help them think through, oh, it's all superficial. It's all capitalist, superficial, consumer oriented type of stuff that that is problematic in its origins and then they won't want to celebrate it because you're now celebrating something that is um, uh, antithetical to our tradition but definitely don't just say don't do it where it's haram that that's too basic of an answer for people in this time you have to go a little bit like three or four layers deeper do some research explain it to them and it should be it should be helpful um, and just say we don't celebrate alongside we have our own that we celebrate and we don't disrespect others we let them do what they have to do but we do not have to take part um, in in that right and uh, especially in the time that we're living in it's very important to have a confident muslim identity very important. And actually, all of this stuff that we're talking about with families, until we have confident Muslim, upright, confident Muslim families, we won't have confident Muslim identities. And then we'll just want to be like everybody else. And you don't want to be in the time we live in like everybody else. That's very risky. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. So we'll go ahead and end with a um, with the dua, inshallah. And then for anything we didn't get to, um, please go ahead and uh, rem uh, do it. We'll do it next week, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الملع العلى اليوم الدين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا أفرغ لنا صبرا وثبت قدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يا الله يا فتاح يا مبين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين بفرج على المسلمين يا الله we ask you يا الله you are the Lord of mercy and of compassion يا رب العالمين we ask يا الله and you are the Lord of gentleness and kindness that you send your لطف and your gentleness upon our brothers and sisters in Palestine يا الله that you remove their this suffering and this genocide and this tribulation that's taken place against them يا الله that you rectify the Muslims that you give victory to the Muslims that you give victory to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you stop the carnage and the, the destruction that's happening in Gaza and the West Bank and Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and Sham and all over the Muslim world Ya Allah Ya Allah we ask Ya Allah that you give victory to the Muslimin Ya Rabbil Alameen completely inwardly and outwardly Ya Allah we ask that you give victory to us inwardly and outwardly that you allow us to implement the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every which way possible, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you allow us, Ya Allah, to implement His Sunnah in our life and that you allow us to implement His teachings in our life. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you for comprehensive ease and comprehensive lutf and comprehensive barakah in our lives, in our relationships, in our family relationships. We ask that you fill our homes with nur and our homes with barakah and our homes with angelic presence and with dhikr and with the remembrance of you and that you remove the anxieties and the worries and the stresses and the tensions and the problems that we have in our homes and that you, that you rectify our hearts internally and externally in every which way possible. Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you, that, you, that you restore, Ya Allah, that you restore this Ummah, Ya Allah, to its greatness and that you allow this Ummah to triumph inwardly and outwardly in every which way possible and that you accept the martyrdom, the shahada of all the shuhada who have passed away, Ya Allah, in Palestine and in Lebanon and all over the Muslim world, Ya Allah, and that you that even though we can't do much physically, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, that you, that you do, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, whatever it is that is in your planning and that is in your divine wisdom for our brothers and sisters, Ya Allah, and that you help us, Ya Allah, as believers all throughout the world remain to become united and to remain united in the best of ways. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim alhamdulillahi